Right, um, I'll make a start. Um, this is us. Um, my name is Richard Walker, and um, I am um, um, at the University of York. And my colleague Rob, um, we've both worked on a research study on um, basically evaluating the impact of the pandemic on um, technology usage, and really sort of determining what's happening now in terms of the where we're going as an institution. So. I'd like to sort of use the time we've got um, in this session to reflect on that and share our results and hopefully um, have a more open discussion with you about um, what your um, institutional context looks like now. So what I'm going to do in this, um, in this uh, session is um, briefly talk about the research and questions we addressed and, and the methods. I'll try and sort of skirt through that quite quickly because the really interesting bit then is our results, what we found and what impact this is um, this is having on where we're going as an institution in terms of our teaching practice and I'd like to sort of test our conclusions with your context and sort of open things up and there's a poll at the end of um, the presentation unfortunately um haven't gone with the vendor's choice of the, the vox but uh, it's with menti but if i can get away with that then um, feel free to contribute but otherwise we'll, we'll just have a discussion so um the research questions what what sort of um what do we focus on well our sort of view was um, there's been an awful lot. There's been a huge explosion of literature on the pandemic, um, but it's been largely um, very much about the reaction, how academics reacted to the, the challenges of the emergencies of the remote teaching phase uh, and, and what was the impact on the student experience as well. And there's been sort of less actually forward thinking in terms of, well, what are the implications and what does this mean sort of long term for um, our, our, our university sort of teaching context. So that's what we wanted to sort of drill into. Now that's a massive question and, it, and it's challenging all in its own right, but we try to sort of contain this somewhat by sort of drilling into a comparative study of two particular departments in the University of York and to sort of look at their context and where they were going. And our, our interest is very much on sustainability. So what were the COVID keeps, as our vice chancellor likes to say, the, the sustainable practice that um, we're going to carry forward and incorporate? What have we learned from the pandemic that's worth sort of keeping and retaining in our in our sort of teaching offer? So that's that's our was our approach. So the departments sort of random. We we could have picked any any sort of departments, but we went to our faculty of science and. Um, departments of biology and psychology. This was a contained study, so it was focused purely on the undergraduates. Um, and so we didn't look at postgraduate uh, study, just on our undergraduate cohorts, but they were still rather large. Biology is, is one of our biggest departments at the university, 1,400 um, students in all. Psychology is a medium-sized one, 700. Um, psychology is uh, has fewer programs, um, a more standardized approach, as I'll, I'll go on to mention, biology more complicated, a variety of different programs and pathways. But what they had in common, um, both very strong teaching and learning sort of um, records prior to the pandemic um, through Subject TEF, which we're not allowed to talk about because it was uh, only a pilot. Um, both departments did very well in that and, um, and also continue to do well in, or have done well in NSS. So they've got strong sort of teaching backgrounds. We were interested in really drilling into their experience and, and how they had um, got on. So I don't know if you're going to be able to see all of that detail, but I'll sort of talk you through it. Um, I think the first thing to mention about the University of York, for those that are unfamiliar with it, is we, we have had a very devolved teaching culture. So although we have faculties, we, we have not had a sort of standardised approach. Um, within and, and across departments, typically. There, there's the academic freedom, those favorite two words, which are always sort of thrown at us, um, really sort of uh, empower academics or have done to sort of really do their own thing. But prior to the pandemic, 2019-20, it's fair to say psychology much more sort of standardized in its approach, um, uh, interactive um, classroom polling um, was a part of the standard offer. Um, and there was a common approach to um, how modules were set up within the VLE as well. 
Biology less so, much more diversity in terms of programmes and within programmes um, how uh, academics like to teach. But um, what they both had um, through our sort of institutional uh, support was um, very good sort of grasp of lecture capture and recording of, of lectures. So that was already there embedded within the university, which was fortuitous with what was to come. So 2020, 21, um, of course, the pandemic hit us all. Um, We've just heard from the, the Kaltura presentation about hybrid, uh, high flex learning. Well, here's another word to add to the lexicon, um, dual delivery. That was the University of York's contribution. And um, by that we meant no um, large scale lectures, so small group teaching only, and with uh, a, a, an element of choice for those that couldn't attend on campus to have a, an online equivalent. There was a pivot to open forms of assessment um, and to a synchronous teaching as the preferred way of doing things. So that kind of forced a convergence of the departments in, in 2020-21 to a, a sort of a more common way of doing things. But then as we came out of the emergency remote teaching and, and were bounced back to campus in 21-22, uh, uh, we saw the departments diverging again. So psychology went back to what they were comfortable with, which um, certainly the levels one, and two was very much this sort of standardized lecture-based approach, which they thought worked well and their students liked, um, well, that's what they thought. Um, biology uh, retained a lot of the, um, the, the lecture recordings that they developed during um, the pandemic and actually moved to a fully flipped way of teaching for um, their undergraduate programs. So they decided to use the contact time on campus just for workshops and to do all the conceptual sort of um, hard yards through the, um, the lecture recordings. So that was, that was their offer. So let's sort of delve into this now and see um, how that fared with students and staff. So first of all, just very briefly, I'll, I'll just talk about research methods. Um, this is an exploratory piece of work. So we, we felt sort of case study um, approach was justified. Uh, what we're interested in is, is getting some insights through the, 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 the reality as experienced by staff and students of uh, the, the pandemic process and what's happened since then. Uh, and we've, to do this, we actually sort of went for small samples, but in-depth um, sort of analysis of, of those samples. So with staff, um, only five staff members were interviewed, so there are obviously caveats to um, to the research that I'm going to report on now, but they were, it was a purposeful sample. These were members of the teaching teams of, of biology and psychology um, uh, programs. So they included the director um, uh, of teaching and learning for um, psychology and the equivalents in, in biology. And as you'll see, um, four and a half hours of um, discussions were had with them and um, over 42,000 words. So there's an awful lot to sort of get at there in terms of analysis. So those were the, the staff, the students, uh, we used semi-structured interviews and where we couldn't get um, individuals together, we did want students together, we, we did individual interviews. Uh, this was conducted either face-to-face -face or via Zoom, um, six and a half hours of, of discussions over 57,000 words. So again, uh, quite a detailed piece of work and particularly to go through the uh, transcription of all of that. Now, this is an important point, and I think um, it relates very well to um, the excellent student panel, which we heard in the keynote this morning. Um, when we talk about students, um, it's a kind of misleading approach often because we, there is this perception we're talking about a homogenous group. But I think as this slide shows, um, the students that we talked to, uh, which were all members of the, the undergraduate population of these two departments, have very different sort of starting points and backgrounds in terms of their education um, and, their, and their approach to the use of technology. So we had three um, students um, that actually started with us before the pandemic. So they had experienced the typical University of York campus-based offer in the first year of their, their program before um, COVID struck. And then we had two uh, students that, um, that we interviewed that uh, joined us during the, the pandemic. So they actually, their starting point was the dual delivery approach. And then the rest uh, joined us um, with the return to campus-based teaching and the, 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 the modified way of learning. So those students, and, and some were international and most were UK-based, would have had um, formative periods of study um, at school um, in, in completely different contexts as well. So, 
I think it's important to realize that when trying to sort of interpret what they're saying and 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 what their expectations are of what a sort of a, a university education should look like. So briefly, um, in terms of the methods, um, we transcribed um, the data and then inductively, um, Rob and I, we worked in independently, we, we um, came up with some um, uh, core themes, which we could use then to um, uh, tag the, um, uh, the, 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 the transcribed material. And we did that uh, through the use of Navivo. What we saw, you can see briefly here, staff, students, what, what were sort of the key, the most common talking points? And our approach was very much semi-structured uh, interviews. So we weren't leading this, we were really sort of opening, asking open questions about um, th their experiences before, during, and, and after. What um, Staff very much fixated on the governance and, and teaching organization of how staff work together and how that had moved forward or not and how that was influencing their teaching practice. For students, um, probably to be expected, they're focused much more on course design and delivery, how they experience that. And interestingly, and this didn't come across in, in this morning's panel, but it did in our sort of focus group um, work assessment was something that they talked about an awful lot in terms of how they experienced that and study skills as well and approaches to, to learning and assessment. So let's explore that a bit more. <coughs> The, um, the headline results for, from an uh, academic perspective were that the, um, I mean, probably the most sort of obvious thing that came to, to us is that the, you can't look at the pandemic in isolation and, and some of the literature I think it, that's out there does do that, that just looks very much as a snapshot of um, how a department or an academic responded at a particular time um, to the challenges that they were facing. But what we saw through the, the, the the dialogues with staff was that, that um, teaching approaches were very much impacted and influenced by what came before the stuff the pre-pandemic and we saw that the, those departments how they've reacted and how they see the future is very much shaped by that as much as what they've learned during that emergency remote teaching phase so contrasting trajectories um, and i suppose that's the beauty of having a devolved uh, teaching culture um, in terms of their approaches to the organization of teaching and learning and standardization and, and what blended learning should look like. So if I, for psychology, it's largely sort of reinforced um, the approach they were taking before, which is that standardization is a very good thing. Consistency um, is important across teaching modules in terms of how the um, modules and content is set up. And we heard that this morning uh, from students, the ease of uh, navigation of, of materials um, and having that sort of common approach, which so students are unsurprised when, when navigating from one module uh, to, to the next and, and, and staff are open in terms of um, how they're conforming. For biology, this was a bit more of a learning point. Um, but what they learned was that um, it's not enough to sort of um, analyze what's, um, how the timetable is, is constructed in terms of a program, but it's, it's what students are actually doing in terms of their learning, both within the formal curriculum and outside of contact hours. And, and both of these departments, being science departments, have large contact hours uh, with, with their students, but it's, it's understanding the, the, the backdrop of the, the informal learning as well and what's going on in order to understand the totality of the, the student learning experience. And, and that's not something they had done prior to the pandemic, but through their own sort of discussions with students, um, they, they gained a sort of a, a, a bigger insight into um, uh, the, the lived student experience and, and that had sort of um, uh, given them a sort of a, a, I think the momentum to, to move towards a more standardized structure and how they, they did things. So with that, um, move, moving forward then, what, what, what's changed and I mean obviously I think we've seen this right across the sector and through the USISA research that I've been involved with as well, we've seen huge sort of um, leap forward in terms of institutional spending, investment in, in learning technologies. So we've seen these departments both sort of more invested through basically training up their staff and um, to, to use learning technologies uh, more actively. But I think the, sort of the key change for both of them is, is we're seeing now more interact, interactivity in on-campus sessions. So less of what I'm doing now and more um, engagement through, through polling in particular, quizzing, breaking up um, uh, class-based sessions, 
Um, but the other sort of the key change, um, certainly for these departments and for York is um, the exploding of the myth that um, in order to meet professional standards and regulatory bodies, you have to have invigilated proctored exams and you need to do things in a very controlled fashion. What, what <coughs> these departments have sort of opted for is open assessment and they see that as the future and as a sort of a, a way towards supporting more authentic um, uh, approaches. So that's been a big one. And, and also where possible to introduce more flexibility in terms of how students engage. So um, the comment from, I don't know if you can read that, from the psychology senior lecturer is um, supervision meetings, for instance. Why do students have to attend in person and come in to campus to meet their supervisor for half an hour when they can use Zoom to do that? So that has now been sort of standardized as, as a way forward. So th those are some of the key changes that we've seen. For students, it's a more difficult picture. Now, we, we were only dealing with 15 in, in total, all undergraduates, as I mentioned, but um, their experiences um, and preferences are very complex and quite nuanced as well. So I think on, we're on safe ground in saying uh, that what they liked and would like to see more of is a focus on um, open assessment. Although the way open assessment is conducted, I think is um, needs to be looked at. So a lot of um, our exams during the pandemic were um, 24 hour uh, assessments. And I think um, some students found that overwhelming and pressured to use all of that time in order to research, rewrite, draft and, and submit. And then the next day they'd be on to the next assignment. So there has been a sort of a calibration of that with sort of six hour sort of open assessments, but that seems to be the way forward. But um, when it comes to flexible learning, this is interesting. Um, the comment from one was, um, it's a blessing and a curse, this, this flexibility thing that you talk about. So um, the, the thing they like is the freedom. And we heard that this morning um, from uh, Emmanuel. Um, the, the ability on demand to, act, to look through curated uh, lecture resources and to um, engage with uh, the material that way. But it's a curse in the sense that um, often students didn't have the study skills and they didn't have the preparation in order to use their time effectively. So some students were watching recordings from start right the way through to finish. And we've seen this in, in the research we've done and James was sitting in the back, led that research actually at, at York prior to the pandemic on um, the need for, for digital literacies for students in engaging with um, uh, learning uh, with lecture recordings. And we were seeing this very much um, repeated by students who were saying that they, they couldn't help themselves by sort of the workload they were investing in and probably the excessive workload in, 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 in spending time taking notes on these lecture recordings and, and not knowing how to sort of manage their time properly. So that was the curse um, of it all as well. So definite opportunities um, with, with the technology, but also a need for support um, and feedback from staff. Um, the other sort of headline results were um, uh, a favour of, of, of small group sessions and, and interaction where possible. The peer-to-peer -peer learning could be lost. So we heard that, that again this morning, this, this sense of isolation during the um, emergency remote teaching phase. So that peer-to-peer -peer learning is really important, having a safe space to ask questions and to share practice. Um, but with all of that, um, they, they also want guidance, they want that scaffolding, they want that structure as well. And that's a way of re relieving um, anxiety and pressure. So having that, that, that structure in place is, is really important for, for students. Uh, and the thing that they, they lacked the most during the ERT period was um, the structured feedback. So having that regular sort of um, um, feedback on an individual basis, um, an informative way to support their learning. And, and one of the key things we heard from students was that, they, that there was a drop in confidence in terms of how they were doing with their studies and how they were performing. And that's, that's been found in other studies, actually. So it's incumbent upon staff to uh, sort of address that in terms of how they, they support their learners. So I'm going to just finish up with some conclusions and then implicate implications, I think, for um, where we go forward. So the conclusions are, in terms of the, the long-term picture of change, in terms of what we think um, the pre-pandemic has done, is clearly it has moved the university forward in terms of uh, technology uptake and usage, uh, in terms of um, 
digitally upskilling our staff, those that have been resistant to, to the use of technologies, um, basically had a baptism of fire during the uh, emergency remote teaching phase. But the benefit of that is that there's a wider acceptance now of the incorporation of technology and the blended offer is, as much as um, fully online. Standardization and organization are not dirty words now in a devolved sort of teaching culture. They're, they're, they're accepted as um, a way of enhancing the student learning experience. And there's a sort of a clearer focus on how we do assessment with um, uh, sort of a pivot to more open assessment and to um, more authentic forms of assessment, which in the era now of um, chat GPT, um, generative AI is, is, a, is a good thing, I would argue. But, you know, from a student perspective, I think there really are uh, tensions which we've still got to work through between flexibility and structure. Uh, offering flexible, flexible learning, addressing the fact that, that there are many different types of students, part-time students, mature students, as opposed to the, the traditional, inverted commas, undergraduates, which are there to attend every face-to-face -face session. So we need to think about them. And we need specific attention to, to, to study skills so that students can navigate between both the, the flexible online experience and what's being offered uh, on campus. And in that, through that study skill support, um, provide students with a workload, um, will address the, those workload issues. So it's, it's getting that trade-off between scaffolding and independence and sort of building students' confidence um, as part of that process. So, and um, finally, so implications for these departments. Uh, one thing we've learned, and I think this is probably the biggest of um, benefit of this sort of um, process we've been through is um, this understanding, this realization that learning design is crucial. Uh, good learning design is crucial. And um, getting that balance between flexibility, structure and scaffolding. And I think it's no surprise that we've seen across the sector um, post pandemic, uh, a lot of uh, learning technology roles, which are learning designer roles, which are actually incorporating, uh, asking, you know, candidates um, to um, uh, apply for roles where they've got demonstra demonstrable uh, learning design skills, not just the sort of technical functional skills. So that's crucial. And then um, looking at um, communication from a teaching perspective, clearer communication of um, skills in terms of how we convey to learners how they're meant to learn and support them and, and address confidence and, and study skills issues as well. And with that, you know, our biology department um, we, at York, we're just about to move from a, uh, to a new academic structure and, and the biology department have used this as an opportunity to, if you like, um, uh, modify their um, fully flipped um, learning approach. So now they're building in a combination of um, workshops and, um, and smaller group sessions and actually building in peer assisted learning where we've got students, um, more mature students coming in to lead workshops on a fortnightly basis to actually sort of help with the study skills part of that as well. So that's a sort of a learning point to actually sort of um, not to go in an absolutist way to, to a fully flipped sort of approach where as we learned this morning, some students can really struggle with the conceptual side and then really sort of lose confidence. So that's, that's us and our departments. And just to sort of finally finish off, um, what, what's the literature saying? Well, I think there are some good learning points out there. Rapanta has talked about the, the importance of, if you want sort of effective learning design, you've got to align institutional teacher and learner expectations in order to, to get effective learning outcomes. So we'd agree with that. And the work by Hartnets et al in, in New Zealand, where they've done a very extensive study of, this, of students' ex, uh, learning experience during the pandemic, have just sort of reiterated this, you know, one size fits all is rubbish. And that, you know, that you, you've got to listen to our different sort of um, students groups with, with care in order to sort of tailor um, the learning experience appropriately. So that's it. That, those are our sort of thoughts. Um, I want to open this up now because we've got time remaining to, to any sort of questions you've got, but also how this resonates with your institutional sort of learning and, and where you see your teaching going at your institution. So there is um, a, a, a poll which we've set up on Menti. So um, if you haven't got a phone that can access this, you can go through an open browser to uh, Mentimeter and, um, and go, the code is 41. 
I will share the results of this sort of mentee um, poll and we'll put it into a blog and share the slides as well um, um, after the conference, if you'd like to um, contribute to that. So that's it. Um, so over to you, any questions or reflections? Yeah, John. Thanks, Richard. That was excellent. Really interesting. Um, a couple of things, but actually the main sort of point, of, I guess, was around sort of how you're structuring the curricula kind of coming out of the pandemic. We had a lot of stories recently about changing the timetabling. And forgive me if you already mentioned it, but are there, are there moves in any of those courses to start to kind of uh, bring, aggregate some of the, the sessions together to provide students, uh, when they're on campus, with more sort of... Uh, uh, connected times rather than kind of big long periods without any activity. Have you seen any of that? Yeah, well, we, we're moving to semesterized um, uh, curriculum structure, uh, 20 uh, credit uh, mo um, modules. Um, we're no longer doing long, thin assessments where you can sit a module and then do the assessment in, uh, uh, two terms later. So that that's enabling a more standardized approach. Um, assessment has to be conducted within the, the, the semester can't go beyond that um, and the, there is a clear focus on on contact um, time within that so this is all a way of trying to sort of provide a more standardized approach but also what we're trying to open up as, and, and other institutions you know are, are ahead of us uh, in this is more interdisciplinary learning the ability to, for, for students later on in their in their, their programs to actually sort of enroll on and modules and other disciplines as well and sort of build a more holistic sort of learning approach. So that's the vision, that's that's where we're going. James. So yeah, uh, really close. So you talk about things like um, consistency and structure and standardization being appreciated by students. And I know that you move into a new deal at the moment. So to what extent do these kind of things factor into say module templating? Because the theory moves towards new deal in the pandemic and we built templates in the middle of the pandemic and suddenly we're a bit old hat now. And yeah, lessons to learn, absolutely valuable. Make better templates going forward. Yeah, well, um, you're right. We we were on, we are on Black, the hosted version of Blackboard. We are on the original at the moment, but um, by um, in the next few weeks, we will be moved. All well, we will be on um, the um, Ultra Course View. We've been spending this summer, um, well, spending the last few months actually working with departments, and they've all bought into. Um, uh, developing standardized templates um, uh, and staff have been trained up to use them. We did no rollover of content, so none of the old junk from previous years uh, appearing in, in, in module sites that staff have started from scratch. And we've used this as an opportunity to uh, introduce by stealth accessibility sort of training. We've been doing this for donkish years and have uh, we've, ha we've had departmental accessibility statements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the, um, a real opportunity to um, ensure that all staff sort of go through that training. Um, you're further ahead at Durham than we are at York. And I think what you're implying is these templates can be subverted. You know, you, you can't lock them down. You can't stop staff from going in different directions if they want. But we hope, you know, through the enculturation process that we've been through and the fact you didn't have this opportunity that we we have had that op opportunity to actually sort of meet uh, staff in person in delivering this training and really sort of get over the values of what we're trying to do and explain why this is important to the student's experience and, and provide evidence base um, for it that um, staff will adhere to this. But of course, there's a regular turnover of staff, new people coming to the institution with their own views. So this is, you can come back to me in a year's time and then I'll give you an honest answer of where we're at. <laughs> Yeah, John again. Just, quick, well, uh, just you obviously profile biology and, and psychology, and they often tend to be sort of, kind of uh, keen consumers of, of technology and stuff. I find in some universities, maybe not all, but uh, how representative do you think that would be of the rest of the institution? Or is it kind of unfair to, to be able to sort of draw any broader conclusions just yet? No, I mean, I think we can. And, um, and I think that's if you, if you look at the silver linings of the pandemic, I think um, it has sort of. Um, forced at, you know, more resistant departments and to actually sort of engage. Now, I mentioned prior to the, um, the pandemic, we had an institutional sort of um, opt-out policy on lecture capture. So that was fully integrated. What, what happened during the pandemic for all um, disciplines, I think, is that through the asynchronous learning was staff having to learn how to sort of in engage with um, uh, their learners through 
distance teaching on campus um, face to face and that that was a great sort of catalyst to um, using polling tools for instance um, uh, but also looking at ways in which you could engage um, learners by curating video um, rather than just doing the lazy thing which is just talking and having it so uh, automatically captured in the background so staff had to learn how to do that that was that was challenging but I think that's one of the dividends which will pay off now, I think, um, because um, across the board we're seeing, you know, departments that were resistant before, um, and this is not for recording, but, you know, um, history of art, let's say, is, is, is one sort of shiny example where staff just didn't do technology and now they do and they, they accept that. So there's greater exposure, I think, to um, uses of a variety of different technologies, but also an understanding of why it's important and what the benefits are. Uh, so I think that that's, but the challenge is going to be sustaining those staff's digital skills, and and for that, that's another conversation. I think another presentation on how we um, construct, you know, institutional sort of um, pathways for staff to to continue to sort of develop their their digital literacies, so um, and their teaching fluencies with with technology. So that's another thing. Good afternoon, everyone. So I think that's me um, up on time. Um, thank you very much for um, your attention and, um, and that's it. Thank you very much.